Chapter 7, Oklavik I had assumed that the name Oklavik, which they told me meant the Bear's Ford, was an ancient one, and that there had always been an Indian or Eskimo village on the site. I was therefore surprised to learn that the town was only recently established, the government having sent a team to survey the area less than 30 years before. I wondered what had induced them to consider founding a town so far away from civilization. It seemed the impetus had been realization that the Delta area could become the center of a thriving industry in the trapping of muskrat and other pelts. The whole valley of the Mackenzie had been opened up by the fur traders. That was a story which covered a hundred and fifty years of enterprise. From the date of Alexander Mackenzie's discoveries in 1789 down until the year 1869, development had been in the hands of of the fur traders themselves. Then, in that year, the newly federated government of Canada purchased Rupert's Land, northern Canada, from the Hudson's Bay Company, and henceforth the administration of the territory became a federal responsibility. Missionaries had been as ardent as the traders and their zeal to explore this new country. The first Anglican missionary was Archdeacon Hunter, who traveled as far as Fort Good Hope in the year 1860, and missions were later established at Fort Simpson, Fort Resolution, and Fort McPherson. By the end of the century, the resident missionary at Fort McPherson was also ministering to the Eskimos at Kittigazuit and Herschel Island. In this area, the first Eskimo baptisms into the Christian faith were admitted into the Anglican Church in 1909. There were white men also resident on Herschel Island at that time. They were whalers who came north by sea, and they had begun wintering on the island in the year 1890. They brought with them goods for trading with the Eskimos, and soon other traders followed. The first recorded trading post Proper was operating on Victoria Island in 1906, and a second one was opened at Bernard Harbor on the nearby mainland in 1911. Between Fort McPherson, the northern limit of the Hudson's Bay Company's line of trading posts, and the post of Herschel Island, there was a gap of roughly 200 miles by water, in which area there were isolated trappers' camps. Goods to provision them must be carried by dog team. From one or other of the two trading posts, this was an arduous method of trading. So in 1912, the Hudson's Bay Company sent two of its employees, Alex and Kenneth Stewart, down the river from Fort McPherson with trading outfits to set up outposts in the Mackenzie Delta. Alex Stewart went by the main channel and stopped near the junction of the Peel and Mackenzie Rivers. Kenneth proceeded down the Peel Channel, or West Branch, and made contact with his customers at the junction of the Peel, <clears throat> the Peel, and the Pokayak channels. 
Here he set up for business, but he was joined immediately by another company, the Northern Company, which had been journeying downriver also and came to set up for trading beside him. This was the original Oklavik settlement called Pakik. This trading center soon became a busy spot, being a halfway house for missionaries, police, and traders traveling between the coast and Fort McPherson. Much of the freight for the area had been coming by sea to the Lebus Trading Company established on Herschel Island. This company also now decided to set up a trading post inland, and they came and settled across the river from Pakiak, the present post office in Oklavik. I had noticed was a log building with the name Lebus Trading Company written above it. After a time, the Northern Trading Company transferred its posts to the same side of the river and the main settlement congregated there. The Anglican mission buildings were erected in 1919. There were now white women and children in the town, and the Anglican missionary opened a school where he taught reading, writing, arithmetic, composition, spelling, geography, and religious knowledge. In 1922 came the government survey. In 1924, the Roman Catholic Church began its work in the area. Six years later, Pfeffer's store was opened. The fine buildings of the All Saints School, in which I now found myself teaching, were opened in 1936 with a trained and qualified teaching staff. The Anglican Hospital was officially opened by Lord Tweedsmuir in 1937, and the Pro Cathedral consecrated during the visit of Archbishop Owen. So a great deal had been accomplished over a short span of years. In the early days of its existence, the mission had had some difficulty in persuading native parents that the school had anything to offer to their children. Indians and Eskimos like to have their families round them, and the idea of being parted from their children did not appeal to them. But since the mission not only educated, but also housed, clothed, and fed the pupils, in time there were more applicants than places to put them in. Remembering the griefs of my own childhood days at a boarding school, I often felt particularly sorry for the little boys and girls in the mission school, one or two of whom were as young as six years old, but the adjustments which I had had to make were much less than those demanded of the children in Oklavik. I was merely moving from one environment to another. They were required to step into a different culture. I became aware of what this transition meant to them as I read the children's written work, although I could not yet get any first-hand experience of the native way of life in this North Country. I did gain some insight into its dangers and privations in correcting the compositions of my pupils. I had persuaded Mr. Gibson to let me take English composition with the senior class, while Ralph reciprocated by teaching my own class <clears throat> Canadian history. This gave me the opportunity to learn a great deal from the children, and it became my aim to have them compile 
an account of their own customs and traditions for the benefit of the white man. I considered that this would be a much more worthwhile ex exercise in social studies for them than the mere imbibing of information which would equip them to answer questions such as which of the rivers in Africa have their origin in the Congo as required by the program of studies. At first, the children were diffident about revealing incidents of their home life, but by the end of the year, I had a collection of descriptions of experiences which my pupils considered commonplace, but which I found enthralling. It was only in their preschool days that they had these trapping adventures. Once they started to attend school, they spent no more winters in the bush. They lived in the school for ten months of the year and went home if their parents lived near enough to the school to fetch them, only for July and August. This was the closed season for taking pelts. The boys generally recorded wintertime adventures. John Alec Robert remembered how. Before I came to school, I used to set traps with my brother. He set them on the bank of a creek. Once, when I was with him, a lynx was caught in a trap. It dragged the trap through the creek a little way. It was caught by one of its hind legs, and it was alive. We had no gun, so my brother went back to the sled to get some wire. I was scared, and I followed him everywhere. After he had got the wire, he cut a willow and made a loop in it and tied it to the wire. Then he went to the lynx and held the wire near its head. It jumped, and its head went into the loop. My brother went into the bush. The lynx could not go after him because the chain which held the trap was tied to, to a big willow. He pulled the wire, and the lynx could not breathe, so it choked. I remember one winter when we were staying in the mountains, said John Francis. There were lots of other people staying with us, too. The men would go hunting for caribou and porcupine. One cold winter day, they went to see if they could find caribou. They tied their dogs at the bottom of the hill. Then they wandered off in different directions. They go two together, so that if one man gets hurt, the other can help him. They shot some caribou, and while some of the men went to get the dogs, the others skinned the caribou and cooked some of it. After they had eaten their meal, they started off for home. Each man had two caribou. It was dark when they arrived. We took the caribou inside our house. The women cut up the meat and cooked it. In the morning, we played outside while the women cut up the rest of the meat. One day, my father went round the hills and when he came back, he had two porcupine. We asked him where he got the porcupine. He said he found it in the hole and killed it. Stephen Bonnet Plume, at thirteen, was the eldest of a large family. His father was now in hospital undergoing treatment for TB and Stephen had to be the man of the family. <clears throat> when the trapping season opened, Stephen was excused school so that he could follow his father's trap line. The family lived in the settlement of Oklavik. He was a tall, thin boy, apparently of weak physique, but with a sensitive, artistic soul. His handwriting was poor, and I had difficulty in deciphering it, 
but he described an adventure on spring ice which made my hair stand on end. My father and I went hunting for muskrats, wrote Stephen. We went on for a long time, and then I saw a rat. I told my father, and he shot it. Then we met George, and we pulled our canoe over a portage and went on a big lake. There was no water yet, except just a little along the shore. We pulled our canoe across the lake. I thought there was a man coming towards us, and all at once I saw it was a bear. We stopped. My father and George ran after it with a twenty-two rifle, and I followed with a rusty axe. Then my father saw that it was a grizzly bear. He did not want to bother it, because I was with him. So we went back to the canoe and lay down, and we all hollered at the bear till it galloped away through the bushes. <clears throat> Tommy Gordon was a little boy, ten years old, also one of a large family. They lived in the town in a one-room, wood-built home. Thea, his mother, was an Eskimo woman who later on gave me an interesting account of life on this Arctic coast before the settlement of Oklavik had been established. She was intelligent but delicate. Her skin was the color of ivory. Her husband was a big man, a Scot. Tommy was not yet proficient in the use of written English, but when I asked him if he could tell me something about polar bears, he produced this account. I am a husky boy. I have seen two polar bears at once. One was a bear cub. My father killed the polar bear, and he looked forward, and he saw a baby bear, and he put the polar bear in the sled. I was sleeping, and he put the polar bear in the house and went to bed. Next day, he went for a hunt again, and he met baby bear. He was sleeping on the snow, and my father put the baby bear in the sled, but he jumped out. My father put the baby bear in the sled again, but he jumped out again. Next day, the baby was hungry, and he was dead. I read these little stories avidly, and awaited impatiently the opportunity to share in similar adventures. Chapter 8 Arctic Winter Winter heralded by the formation of ice on the river on the day of my arrival, advanced apace. Conditions indoors were so much warmer than any I had been accustomed to in England that at first I had been impatient with the necessity for having the rooms hermetically sealed. In my bedroom there was a two-framed casement window one side of which was fixed, the other side opened inwards, and was protected on the outside by a storm window of thick glass. Along the lower edge of the frame of the immovable part of the window there were three holes, each about one inch in diameter, covered by a little block of wood on a swivel. Finding the bedroom too warm at night, I began by sleeping with the inner casement open. The result of this was that the storm window behind it became thickly frosted during the night with the condensed moisture of the air in the room. Then I tried shutting the casement and lifting the block of wood to open the holes in the other half. Below them in the morning there was a ridge of ice an inch thick. In time I learnt to keep 
all openings closed. When I was dressing, I liked to linger and gaze at the scene outside. In the dawn, the red lights on the mast at the signals station glowed like rubies over the frosted bushes, and the distant snow-covered mountains were softly shaded with gray or flushed pink and gold by the hidden sun. It was soon too cold for outdoor sports, such as skiing or skating. The main activity was indoor curling. I was embarrassed when I first was invited to take part in this sport, thinking how untidy my hair must look to provoke such a remark in public, but I found that curling in Oklavik had nothing to do with hair. It was the chief sport of the winter, and it seemed that the whole town took part in it. Names of all those, white or native, who wished to play were drawn in teams of four, and there was great excitement when the list of teams for the season were posted in the Hudson's Bay Company store. The experts, meanwhile, were preparing the rink. This was a part of the river bank, enclosed by stout wooden walls in which window openings were cut here and there. The rink was roofed over, but the windows were unglazed so that the cold air could come in, keeping the surface of the ice well frozen. Spectators sat in a heated room at the end of the rink, separated from the ice by a glass wall. At the beginning of the season, water was pumped from the river to cover the area of ground to a depth of several inches. This was left to freeze for a few days, and then the surface was polished with a mop made from a wide strip of wood covered with fur nailed to a broom handle. Curling, I found, was a game something like lawn bowls on ice. You hurled a rock to slide down the ice and come to rest at the prescribed spot on the target area at the other end of the rink. The first step for a novice to learn was how to send the rock. It was very easy to hurl yourself instead and find yourself spread-eagled on the ice, but still firmly attached to the rock. When you first felt the weight of the object, which you were required to send skimming down the ice, you would exclaim, but I can't even lift it. The point was that you were not required to lift it. The knack lay in the flick of the wrist. When you had at last mastered the art of getting it over the line into play, you found that you had developed so much knack that the rock sailed through the target area like an ice yacht and crashed into the wooden boundary wall beyond. Then one proud day your rock came to rest on the very spot you were aiming for. You turned modestly aside, and a moment later, hearing an unexpected thud, you swung round to see that your opponent had knocked it right out of play. Curling was a game which you could not play for yourself alone. You must follow the directions given by your skipper, who stood at the far end, and in consultation, perhaps, with his second man, decided where he wanted the rock's placing, and then called for instance, for an out curve with plenty of ice. 
two teams of four players each played in each game. The individuals delivered two rocks each, the members of the opposing teams playing alternately. After the rocks had been thrown, the score was reckoned according to the position of the rocks on the target area, the highest score going to the team whose rock was nearest to the center. The speed of the traveling rock could be increased by polishing the ice in its path. This was done with long bristled flexible brooms by two members of the same team who faced each other and ran sideways down the rink just ahead of the rock, sweeping the ice madly as they ran. If the skipper saw that the rock was gaining too much speed, he shouted, hold it, and the sweepers retired. I, being new to the game, was number one in the team, which meant that as soon as I had thrown my rocks, I became a sweeper. In between shots, the skipper was apt to have a long consultation about the placing of the next rock and my mind would become occupied with the question of the next day's arithmetic lesson. Suddenly, I would be galvanized into action by the yell, sweep, as the rock went skimming past me, and I would race along the ice in a vain attempt to overtake it. Running sideways and sweeping at the same time was another skill that had to be acquired. The rink was in use every night of the week from 7 to 11 p.m. After the last game, some of the players would return to the mission for more coffee and talk late into the night discussing the strategies of the different skippers and planning their revenge. At breakfast the next morning, the first question was always, who won, and there would be more post-mortems of the lost games. The season, which lasted from late October to early May, was climaxed by a whirlwind three-day tournament at a holiday weekend when the rink was in use continuously. After this, cups and prizes were awarded handsome Hudson's Bay Company blankets and silver butter dishes and traveling clocks. Christmas preparations began around the middle of November when an SOS went out from the mission for willing workers to assist Santa Claus and ladies from the town gathered in the principal's house to help wrap the gifts. There was a present not merely for every child in the mission school, but for every child in the town and the settlement across the river. These gifts were sent by members of church organizations in Toronto and other Canadian cities, and included items they that would thrill any child, a baby doll, for instance, complete with an extra set of underwear or a pair of scarlet suede mitts, or a cowboy spurs with pistols. Each gift was attractively wrapped in colored tissue, tied with tinsel ribbons, and individually named. Muriel prepared for the festive season by doing her Christmas baking a month beforehand. A day was chosen when the outside temperature was over 20 below zero, and 200 extra loaves were baked. These were taken steaming hot from the oven, put into sealed tins, and handed through the washroom window to Pete, who ranged them along the flat roof. 
they froze at once, and when thawed out a month later, they tasted like new bread. After this, a thousand doughnuts were made and similarly dealt with. Then one evening, a week before Christmas, the staff formed yet another assembly line in the kitchen. Before piles of peanuts, whistles, candies, crowns, puzzles, satin hair ribbons, combs, brooches, more candies, booklets, and named Christmas cards, new woolen stockings were passed down the line, and something from every pile was put into each of them. The traditional Christmas Eve function. At the mission, was the school concert when each class put on some little performance for the entertainment of the visitors. This year, on Christmas Eve, a Sunday, the concert was booked for the Saturday evening. On this night, the children were almost too excited to eat. The burning question for all those whose homes. Were out of town was, has my family come to town? For the past week, the dog teams had been following each other at intervals across the river, traveling through the darkness of the winter days for nearly a hundred miles. The Eskimos coming from Toyakutuk in the north, and the Indians from Fort McPherson to the south. A large audience was expected. The partition between my own big classroom and the boys' playroom had been folded back, and a stage erected against the wall. In front of this were rows and rows of benches and desks. As the guests. Began to arrive, the concert performers would keep peeping out of the classrooms, where they were being dressed, <clears throat> and rushing back again to announce the names of the latest arrivals. Parcels were thrust into eager hands and unwrapped to show the new embroidered mukluks to be worn for the performance. And there would be exclamations of envy from all sides. The people streamed in. They brushed the snow off their boots, with the broom kept at the door for the purpose. Untied the tapsi, a multicolored hand-woven girdle, round their waist, and hauled the sleeping baby out of the back. Of the parka, gathered up a horde of little brothers and sisters, and poured into the concert hall. The white people of the town were there in force too: the district administrator, the doctor, the game warden, the signals sergeant major, the staff sergeant of the mounties, the day school teacher, the meteorologist, the airlines official. The postmaster, the hotel keeper, they all came with their families. The performers waiting in the wings were almost prostrated with fright. My own pupils were so shy that I had despaired of getting any audible result in dramatic work, and so had compromised by producing a concerted item in which two groups spoke. The chorus, while individuals mimed the action, it was a peculiar effort. But there was such a noise from the audience that it did not make much difference. Their second item was an English folk dance. I had not yet discovered that square dancing was second nature to them. At last, the ordeal was over. The costumes were discarded. The songs and drills and recitations could be forgotten until next year. The younger children were now taken up to bed. 
but some of the older boys and girls stayed up to act as hosts to the visitors. With trays of cups of tea and donuts, they circulated among the crowds in the dining room and along the corridors, where the Eskimo parents in furs and Mother Hubbards sat on the floor laughing and chattering with their families around them. The donuts soon disappeared, but it took a long time to empty the tea urns, and Pete, who was getting impatient, restoked the furnaces until the heat became almost unbearable. Still the guests lingered, and it was after midnight before the staff escorted the last of them to the door. Then we went to tackle the washing up. On Christmas Eve, excitement was in the air. Through the open doors of the classrooms, the colored lights on the little Christmas trees could be seen shining in the darkness. In the school corridor, a tall, illuminated tree reached nearly to the ceiling, and in the staff sitting room, there was another tree, with the floor around it knee-deep in parcels. At bedtime, each child was given a new stocking to hang on his peg in the upstairs washrooms. Then, in the small hours on Christmas Day, while the children were asleep and the staff were at the midnight communion service in the cathedral, Santa Claus arrived and crept round the dormitories, substituting filled stockings for empty ones. When the rising bell went <clears throat> an hour earlier than usual, there was a stampede from the dormitories, and the stockings were seized and borne to the beds, where their contents were dumped and the treasures discovered. On Christmas morning after breakfast, Gwen and I took charge of all the children while everyone else helped to prepare the tables in the dining room. On this day, the children sat in family groups with their brothers and sisters and cousins. The staff had a snack cold meal in the kitchen, and then we all served the Christmas dinner. Taking in unlimited helpings of juicy reindeer meat with thick gravy, potatoes, and canned corn, followed by Christmas pudding and sauce with mugs of creamy milk to drink. The milk, of course, was made from powder. While the washing up was dealt with, the children were banished to the playroom to watch <clears throat> for the arrival of Santa Claus in person. A messenger had come over from the hospital to say that he was there handing out gifts to the patients. The washers-up had finished the dishes when shouts announced his approach. He drove up in fine style, cracking the whip, but he had a team of dogs instead of reindeer. He came in, puffing and stamping from the cold, and greeted the children with a Scottish accent. They all gathered round the big tree in the corridor, and one by one the gifts were handed to Santa, who called out the name of the lucky recipient, Ellen Snowshoe, Tommy Kalaukhok, Mary Alaska, and shook hands with each one with a word of good cheer. Some of the little ones were so much awed that they had to be pushed forward to receive their gifts. There were no lessons during the week but the teachers had daytime duties with the children, and now, for the first time, 
I was able to go for a walk across the river. To me, a real frustration of this life had been the feeling of being shut in from the out of doors. On my precious day off duty, every alternate week, there was not time to do much more than visit the bay for the necessary shopping during the midday hours of twilight. There was only one road out of town, an earth track three or four miles long, heading in one direction to an area which had been intended for an airport, and in the other to the meteorological station. The only other highway was the river, so when it became my turn to take the girls for a walk, I said, let's go on the river. The main crossing was in front of the bay, but the snow looked hard and dirty, where the teams of dogs were constantly passing. There was a wide expanse of clean white snow on either side of it, and I made for this. The children hesitated, and Elizabeth said, the trail is over there. Oh, never mind the trail, I replied. Let's walk in the clean snow. <clears throat> I soon had to bring them back to the trail. The snow was deeper than it looked, and the little ones were too cold. I found that snow, which had been subject to minus zero temperatures for months, bears no resemblance to English snow. There is nothing wet about it. When I had first seen the mission children lying in the snow, I had said, Get up, child, you'll catch cold. Catch cold, they had replied, How? Get up, I repeated, you'll get rheumatism. They got up and gave their clothes a shake, and the dry, powdery snow disappeared. They were as fond of rolling in the snow all down the river bank <clears throat> as an English child is of rolling in the grass down a sloping meadow. During Christmas week, there were various functions culminating in a dance in the Legion Hall at which the women were to wear formal gowns. The nurses and other young girls were thrilled about this. Elsie and Vera, who were both good needlewomen, had gone so far as to send out a radio message for patterns and material to be flown in, and Vera had made a really beautiful pre raphaelite looking gown of wine-colored velvet. I was on duty that night and could not stay long at the dance. I did not enjoy it very much as everyone was drinking excessive quantities of whiskey or overproof rum. The festive season was climaxed by the celebrations in the native hall on New Year's Eve. First of all, everybody went to the cathedral for the watch night service. The building was packed, and as the congregation filed out afterwards, the native boys grabbed their rifles, which they had left standing in the porch, and fired blank cartridges to welcome the new year. Then the crowds moved off to the native hall. This was a large, single-roomed building heated by two wood-burning stoves. The native party had been organized by Jim Coe, the government-appointed Indian chief, and his wife. Miss Coe had been educated at the Hay River Anglican Mission School, and her house had muslin curtains at the windows and polished linoleum on the floor. When we entered the native hall, I was astonished first of all at the numbers of people in the room. Indians and Eskimos ranged in orderly rows. Some of them were sitting on benches, but more were on the floor. There were swarms of children, all well behaved. The babies were invisible, sleeping down the back 
of their mother's parkas, where one would have thought they might suffocate. In spite of the heat from the stoves, most of the people kept out their outer garments. They even danced in them. The huskies put on their performance first. Along the middle of the right-hand wall was a bench where half a dozen Eskimo men were sitting holding drums. Disc-shaped instruments made of caribou parchment stretched over a hoop about 18 inches in diameter with a handle attached. The drummer held his instrument by this handle and beat the skin lightly with a pliable willow wand. Some of the dances were performed solo by a man or a woman. Others were performed by three or four dancers together in a series of rhythmic, jerky movements in unison. To the accompaniment of a chant sung by the men. In every dance there seemed to be a point at which a familiar chorus was reached. When the dancers stabbed with their arms and stamped with their feet more and more vigorously until with one final aya the dance was over. It was all done with the greatest merriment. I was fascinated by these dances and appealed to the people on either side of me to explain the symbolism. But the white people did not know, and the Eskimos either did not choose to tell me or did not know themselves. I supposed I should have been similarly at a loss if an Eskimo in an English theater had asked me to explain the formal movements of the ballet. It seemed as if the solo dancer was miming a story of a seal hunt, for instance, but the more social dances were stylized and their symbolism was probably traditional. Next came the Indian native dances, about which I had heard so much and I anticipated a new experience. I was surprised to find that they were easily recognizable. Scottish folk dances, little drops of brandy and strip the willow, for instance, doubtless taught originally by the Scottish fur traders in the olden days and adapted for their own enjoyment by the Indians. One dance, the jig, was a very popular item. A young Indian in embroidered parka and mukluks would come out onto the dance floor and with flickering feet move up and down the room while his girl danced alongside him with downcast eyes. After a time, when the boy's agility and invention were tiring, another youth would come onto the floor in challenge and the first man would have to retire, while the newcomer, fresh and full of energy, set the pace anew. The next moment a girl would similarly take over from <coughs> the first girl, and so it went on with never more than two dancers on the floor at the same time. Now and then a white woman would give the challenge, but she had not the technique of the Indian girl. Sometimes a white man, not to be outdone, would take over from the Indian youth, but his capers would only cause peals of laughter from the onlookers. The room was then given up to the communal square dancing in which everybody joined. The formation was not in sets of eight, but a double circle all the way round the room. 
When the dance began, the first couple moved to perform the figure with the next. Then, on to the third. When they came to the fourth couple, the second couple would start with the third, and so it went on, each couple taking up the figure when the couple before them had passed on. Thus the room was soon a whirl, the embroidered mucklucks with their swinging tassels flashing in and out. The mission staff had to leave early, in view of their duties the next morning. But the dance went on all night, and perhaps the next night too. The most exhausted person at the end of it must surely have been the fiddler, whose tapping feet had been as busy as his bow. After Christmas, life returned more or less to normal. I was now experiencing the polar night for the first time, the sun having sunk below the horizon in the southern sky around noon on November 21st and stayed there. Indoors, lights burned night and day, but the people were no worse off than basement workers in city stores in winter. Out of doors, the nights and days were superb. The moon, when full, shone throughout the 24 hours. It was a strange experience to go into the dark classroom for morning school and find a pool of moonlight spilling over the desk. The northern lights were almost continuously on display. They swept across the sky like giant searchlight beams, penciled upwards like organ pipes trembled and shimmered overhead in waves of pastel-colored haze, focused like stage floodlights in the vault of heaven, cut a swath out of the darkness from horizon to horizon, swirled like an ellipse round the pole. The snow sparkled in the moonlight, overlaid with the dove-gray shadows of puthering plumes of smoke, and the squares of light from uncurtained windows patched the back cloth with gold. Dog teams belled and tasseled, loped along the river bank, drawing toboggans piled with logs. In the garden of the administrator's house, someone had built an igloo out of ice blocks, colored lights inside the dome cast a diffused blue and red and green glow through the walls. Between eleven o'clock in the morning and two in the afternoon, there was a subdued daylight, and often there would be sunset effects in the southwestern sky between two and three o'clock. One Saturday afternoon before Christmas, I had been walking along the river bank to the Hudson's Bay Company store when my eye was held by the display of color in the sky across the river. Behind the black fringe of the spruce trees there were vivid layers of flame and gold and copper surmounting a pall of inky blue. I stood in silence watching the color change, when suddenly a live coal seemed to detach itself from the flame and begin weaving its way back and forth. I gazed, incredulous, following the zigzag path of the ember, which appeared almost to be writing a message in the sky. Then the ghostly coal came swooping down towards the river and materialized as the light in the port wing of an aeroplane. The strong cold had now set in. By the middle of January, the temperature on successive days was 42, 49, 53, 51, 55 degrees below zero. If on an occasional day it rose to 15 below, as long as there was no wind, 
It was a pleasantly warm day, but a temperature of only ten below. If there was a wind, which generally blew from the north or northeast, made conditions intolerable for those of us who were not used to them, and we were all glad to stay indoors. There was no midday walk for the children now. They stayed in the playrooms during the dinner hour break. Most of the older girls occupied themselves with some piece of craft work. Some wove beaded belts or bracelets on a bow-shaped loom made from a willow branch using a tiny seed beads which were sold in the stores. Others made mitts and mucklucks for themselves or miniature dolls, moccasins or mitts out of moose hide, some embroidered with beads and others with wool or silk. They loved bright colors and mixed them indiscriminately to the disapproval of the sewing matron who would talk to them about good taste, but I found their brilliant and flamboyant harmonies very pleasing. Some of the girls knitted socks from printed instructions. The boys made miniature dog whips and canoes and toboggans. The little children sat on the floor playing with jacks, throwing a handful of these into the air and catching them in different formations. The Eskimo children amused themselves playing cat's cradle with a piece of string. They could make many different designs and gave names to them such as the seal at his breathing hole or the hunter and his dog. Whether or not my depression was due to the darkness and cold, I began now to feel the frustrations of my new life more acutely. To me, the most intolerable of these was the necessity to live according to a prescribed pattern. I must not only go to church when required to do so, I must also refrain from going to church when required to do so, if it was my turn to take some particular duty. True, the same sort of thing applied in any boarding school, but in civilization you could go for a walk or go away for the weekend or invite a friend to stay and so refresh yourself against the inevitable pinpricks of the day's routine. Here, circumscribed by the walls of the school buildings, I sometimes felt frantic and lay on my bed wondering how on earth I could endure it for four consecutive years. On my precious off-duty day, once a fortnight, I was not able to relax because, as it was a Saturday, the morning was giving up to cleaning, with the consequent noises in the corridors, the clanking of pails, the whirring of polishers, the necessary calling backwards and forwards, and now that the children had to play indoors, there was a continuous noise from the playrooms. A contributory factor to my feeling of depression was the failure to find a common denominator in my relationship with Roger. We were strangers, the cynicism which he expressed on the occasions when we conversed was so much at variance with the warm humanity which had permeated his letters that I was bewildered. He was well known at the mission where for the past year or two he had been dropping in regularly when he was in town, but even here it seemed to me he was not socially at ease. Perhaps he really was a recluse, the spiritual depths pent up within him to be released only when he could pour out his soul on paper. Now that he was at last face to face with his correspondent, this channel of escape was sealed. Well, I was committed to life in the North for four consecutive years. Perhaps in that time, the psychological barriers could be overcome. Chapter 9 the sun comes back. The chief source of entertainment during these winter days was situated in the main street of the town, near the government administration office, 
and the signals depot, an unpretentious wooden building labeled C-H-A-K, the friendly voice of the Arctic. This was the local broadcasting studio, a plain little hut furnished with a few benches and a counter grill like that in a village post office behind which the broadcaster would sit. Its construction had been the idea of a signals sergeant major who felt that such an amenity would bring comfort and recreation into the lonely lives of trappers and traders living in isolated conditions. Funds for its installation were provided by traders and residents in the town, and a big stock of records was provided originally from surplus army stores and canteen services. The station was now maintained by the signals personnel and financed by the income received from the charge of 25 cents for every broadcast of a record by request. Announcers and disc jockeys were recruited <clears throat> from among people in the town who were prepared to give up an evening from 7.30 to 11 p.m. For this purpose, if no one volunteered, there was no program, but this very rarely happened. The two Andes had even sacrificed themselves for a month or so before Christmas by getting up early to give a breakfast time program. The personnel of the Navy detachment gave musical recitals on records on Monday and Friday evenings. Tuesday and Thursday were request nights when the air was loud with cowboy songs and square dance rhythms. On Wednesday nights there was a trapper's hour when a clerk from the bay read adventure stories and played records. On Saturday afternoons the cannon assisted the, by Gwen ran a patient's party for the patients in the two hospitals. At this, messages and records were broadcast without charge, and during the program, the cannon would give a res resume of the week's items of local news and announce such notices as appeals for help in preparing the curling rink, or warnings from the medical officer about the disposal of sewage, or invitations to attend evening classes being organized by the day school teacher in the town. After the plush carpeted studios of the BBC, the little single-roomed Oklavik station might seem rather primitive, but it gave me a thrill to sit behind the counter, surrounded by piles of gramophone records, and talk to people round the rim of the pole. From time to time during the program, the door would open to admit a group of natives in their embroidered garments. They would thrust a coin and a slip of paper under the grill and later on in the program the announcer would play Have You Ever Been Lonely? or Good Night, Irene with appropriate comments. For a listener in a winter camp or an Eskimo who spoke little English would come in with a message for a relative who was on his way to town and would be invited behind the grill to speak directly into the microphone in his own language. The message would be picked up 
on the little portable radio bought at the bay, which traveled on every toboggan. Most messages, Indian or Eskimo, ended with a few words committing the recipient to the care of God. Throughout Sunday from 10 a.m. to 8.30 p.m., CHAK took the place of church for all those whose isolation or indisposition cut them off from the church's ministrations. From 10 to 11 o'clock, Mass was celebrated in the Roman Catholic Chapel and broadcast from the study of the Father in Charge. At 11, the Luchuk's Indian service was broadcast from the Anglican Cathedral. The Indian deacon, the Reverend James Stichinilli, officiated. It was my duty to take the Luchuk's boys and girls from the school to this service. I joined in the service as well as I could, though I found the words in the native prayer book almost unpronounceable. The Lord's Prayer, for instance, began thus, Nikojit ni yiji zia zit quicket nung kong ako takanish. At twelve fifteen, the woman missionary from the Pentecostal mission read a service accompanied by gramophone records from the studio. In the afternoon, from two to three, the service for the Eskimos was broadcast from the cathedral. At this service, the canon officiated, reading the lessons in the native tongue, but he preached in English, and an Eskimo member of the congregation stood beside him in the pulpit and translated his sermon phrase by phrase. The service book of the Western Eskimos contained Eskimo versions of Canadian prayers and hymns, their tongue was full of L's and K's and reminded me of Welsh. The Lord's Prayer in Eskimo began. Apakaput Kalangimutin Akten Nagayali Atanagovan Kali Isamatin Sana Ikili Mani Nuami Kalaktaknako Ablumi Eleogo Nekesapatiknik Ayatkurukut. At the seasons when the Huskies were in town, the cathedral was full for this service. The mothers and children would sit on one side of the church and the fathers on the other. If the little ones wandered out of the pew, and down the aisle to have a closer look at the preacher, or if mother hauled the baby out of the back of the parka and began to feed it, nobody took exception to it. After the Eskimo service, the Roman Catholics took over again until the evening. At four o'clock, the father gave a concert of classical music on records, which was very acceptable to many people, and from 6 to 7.30, the service of Vespers was broadcast. Immediately after it, the main English service of the day was broadcast from the Anglican Cathedral again. Two of the schoolboys, like Robin Redbreast, in their Sunday shirts, acted as monitors sitting beside the apparatus in the chancel, adjusting it to the speaker's voice and handing the microphone from pew to lectern 
or pulpit as required. Sunday was no day of rest for the mission staff, with its church attendances, escorting of the children, Sunday school teaching, and other necessary duties. But after the evening service came the highlight of the week, a social hour at the mission, when the adult members of the congregation would troop over to the school one week and to the hospital the next for coffee and conversation. They sat informally all round the sitting room, while the members of the staff who were on duty handed round silver trays containing cups of coffee with cream and sugar and iced cakes. When all the chairs were occupied, the younger people would overflow into the kitchen, and soon their laughter would be ringing across the corridor to mingle with the more sober tones in the sitting room. There was often a surprise item when a portable screen would be put up and Mr. Gibson or the canon or the game warden or some visiting government official would show colored slides or a homemade movie of the latest adventures in the Arctic. No thrill in civilized life compares with the thrill of mail day in an isolated settlement. On the day scheduled for its arrival once a fortnight at this season of the year, everybody was on the alert, listening for the hum of the plane's engine. If it failed to arrive, the disappointment, to me at least, was bitter. The first delivery after my arrival in Oklavik had ordered on the day when I had mistaken the red light for a live coal, and I hurried back from my shopping to see what the mail had brought. There was no question of a postman going round from door to door. The population would allow about half an hour after the plane's arrival for the sorting of the mail at the little log post office, and then they converged on the building and keyed up to receive their letters. The mission mail was fetched by Pete and Mr. Gibson, and impatience must be curbed until they came staggering in with the bag. Then the shout of mail in could be heard all over the building, and the members of the staff left their duties and ran into the big kitchen. The contents of the bags would be tipped out onto the floor, and the first comers, down on their knees, drew out the packets and letters and cards, calling out the names of the addresses, who would grab their precious letters and drop into the nearest chair to enjoy them. Then at supper time there would be a happy interchange of news from home, but this first mail day was a very disappointing one for me. All my letters contained indignant demands from my friends as to why I had not at least notified them of my safe arrival. One day in the middle of January, during the noon hour break, there came a shout from the girls' playroom. The sun came back, and we all went running to see. The big windows looked out onto the southern sky, where the bronze rim of the sun was just breaking over the horizon for the first time in nearly two months. A few minutes later, it had disappeared again, but from now on it would come up a little higher each day and stay up a little longer, until by the end of May, <clears throat> it would be shining all round the sky, 
throughout the 24 hours. As the days lengthened, I found the confinement indoors more and more irksome. Now that the sun had come back, there was a dazzling radiance on the snow, and I longed to follow the dog teams across the river and explore the distant shoreline. Although the thermometer fastened outside the dining room window registered day after day, temperatures way below zero, I was still thinking in terms of an English winter, and I decided one noon that I would go out and enjoy the sunshine. Before I was halfway across the schoolyard, I had to turn and run for shelter. The outfit, which had seemed so snug when I set out for Liverpool, was no more protection than a wisp of cotton in this latitude. I had to learn how to dress before going for a walk. This involved an operation which took ten minutes or more. You first stripped to the skin and put on winter underwear, long woolen combinations that reached to the ankles. Over this went thick ski pants, lined, and a couple of pairs of stout woolen socks and duffel booties inside the mucklucks. These were snow boots made by the natives. The feet were of moose hide and the legs of embroidered woolen material trimmed with a strip of the fur of marten or muskrat or wolf and laced round the top with tasseled cord braided in vivid colors. A soft woolen twin set and the parka, a tunic hooded and trimmed with wolf or fox or wolverine fur, completed the ensemble. The Indian trappers liked to have a parka cover made of a wind and weatherproof fabric called Grenfell cloth in brilliant colors, which protected the garment underneath. Many of the Indians and all the white women who could afford them wore the native-made, hand-embroidered parka of Stroud, a woolen material which Pete said was made in England and obtainable only north of the Arctic Circle. It was very expensive. Men and women both wore these handsome garments. The men's were shorter than the women's. The Eskimos preferred parkas made of fur, and some of them wore knee-high white fur boots made from strips of reindeer hide. The almost universal garment with the native women was a long flowered cotton robe, something like a nightgown, frilled at the bottom and with long sleeves frilled at the cuff. This coverall was called a Mother Hubbard. It was conveniently laundered over dress, which could be kept fresh-looking in the winter, and in the summertime it provided some protection from the mosquitoes. Like the men's gay greenfell cloth parkas, the Mother Hubbard was cut in the traditional style, the hood all in one piece with the rest and with no opening down the front of the garment. This was to ensure that the chest was protected from the wind when the wearer, wearer was riding on the back of a toboggan. The frills at bottom and cuffs of the dress were bordered by a strip of intricate pattern contrived by superimposing tiny pieces of bias binding in blue and black and red and yellow. The women seemed to have a passion for making these border patterns. Another essential item of clothing was the pair of trapper's mitts on a harness of brightly braided wool. The palm of the glove was of moose hide and the back of fur, generally wolf or lynx, 
long tassels hung from the cords of the harness. These would swing from side to side as the wearer drove the sledge and brush off any snow which might fall from overhanging bushes onto his shoulders. Now that Christmas was well behind us, Jim, the deacon, and Thomas, the two Indian mission workers, could be spared to go out and get caribou meat for their families. According to report, they would have to go far, as this season the caribou were migrating by a more distant route. In the olden days, when the herds changed their path of migration, it meant suffering. and often starvation for the people. Nowadays, there was always food available in the stores for the people who could not afford it. To those who were destitute through misfortune, old age, perhaps, or illness, the Mounties would issue a special ration which, though meager, would keep them alive. The hunting party consisted of Jim and Thomas and their friends, with more than thirty dogs and six toboggans, loaded with oil stoves, rifles, radio, and food supply, including plenty of frozen fish for dog food. A man can go for several days without, <clears throat> without food, if in good condition, but the dogs, pulling a loaded sledge for thirty or forty miles a day, must be fed daily. Thomas and a young fellow became separated from the main party. They had to go further and further afield until they finally came across Caribou, a hundred and fifty miles from Oklavik. They shot their quota of animals and then set out for home. Then the weather changed. From the comparative warmth of twenty below zero, the temperature dropped to fifty-five below and stayed there. Other misfortunes followed. The weight of snow on top of the ice sometimes causes water to flood the surface as the toboggan passes over. One dog was immersed in this flood water and froze to death overnight. Then roaming dogs found the cache of food and devoured it. Thomas had to cut up two of the caribou for dog food and jettison three others to lighten the load for the remaining dogs. Another dog had its feet so badly cut by jagged ice that it had to be carried in the toboggan. After about ten days, Jim returned. By the end of the second week, we were all getting anxious about Thomas. He arrived at last, his brown face creased, into the usual broad smile, in spite of the black circles of his frozen cheeks. I had been surprised to find that hunting in the Northwest Territories is not a sport, as in other parts of Canada. Here its purpose was essentially connected with subsistence. Fur was needed for clothing and meat, meat for food so it had always been for the native races. They had killed to provide for their physical wants. Then the white man had come along and demanded much more killing in order to satisfy his greed for fur. He had introduced the people to the rifle and the steel trap and rewarded them for indiscriminate slaughter of the fur-bearing animals then, with bewildering inconsistency, he had begun to make laws to conserve the animal population, prohibiting the killing of some and limiting the taking of others by imposing a quota which the hunters must not exceed. They must, at first, have found it difficult to accept this. The question of a close season was probably comprehensible to them since they knew that after breeding the adult animals were too lean to make good eating, but to forbid them to shoot more than five caribou in a season out of herds of thousands,
to forbid them to sell caribou meat to the white trader, who was not allowed to hunt for himself, to forbid them to give to their dogs surplus meat if it was fit for human consumption. All this must have seemed nonsensical, but I learned later that the purpose of the game law was to provide for the conservation and systematic development of the wildlife resources of the Northwest Territories and to secure the orderly regulation and proper utilization of those resources. Most of the Indians and Eskimos in the territories, it stated, depend on hunting for food, shelter, and clothing. The game ordinance provides a measure of protection for them against unequal competition and careless or unscrupulous exploitation. If the restrictions imposed caused what seemed to be hardship on the population, the people who felt aggrieved must remember that they have been adopted with the object of conserving game resources for the use and benefit of all the inhabitants. Quotation from Game Laws of the Northwest Territories of Canada, 1st of March, 1951. The white man in the North must also have meat to eat, but he had neither the skill nor the equipment nor the time to go hunting caribou, and sheep and cattle could not be reared in that latitude. He could, of course, have had meat flown in from Edmonton. The military units and the Mounties were provisioned in this way, but with air freight charges at the equivalent of ten shillings per pound weight, this was a prohibitive undertaking for the ordinary citizen. There was, however, a source of supply in the herds of reindeer, which the Canadian government, with commendable foresight, had introduced into the Delta area over twenty years earlier. They were able to profit from the experience. gained by the authorities in Alaska, who at the end of the 19th century had imported from Siberia about 1,200 reindeer, together with experienced Laplanders from Scandinavia, to teach the Eskimos to herd deer instead of hunting them. This herd had multiplied to some 200,000 in 30 years, encouraging the Canadian government to buy 3,000 animals from an Alaskan company with the purpose of having them driven from Elephant Point, Alaska to Kitagazuit on the east of the Mackenzie Delta, a trek of 2,600 miles, crossing three mountain ranges, swimming streams, fording rivers, the herds suffered from time to time, great hardships, scattered by blizzards, attacked by wolves, maddened by mosquitoes. It took five years to complete the trip. I was told that the reindeer were now herded in a game reserve which covered 6,000 square miles, all the land east of the delta to the Anderson River, and north to the coast. The administrative work connected with the maintenance of the herds being carried on at Reindeer Station, about halfway between the coast and Oklavik, at the foot of the Caribou Hills. The original herd had multiplied, and I learned that there were now about 5,000 reindeer in the main herd and 800 in each of the subsidiary herds. Of these, six or 700 were slaughtered annually for food. The killing was supervised by government officials and took place in November or December. It was this meat which was allotted 
to the hospitals and schools in Oklavik and to the traders in the area. The Sunday joint at the mission was delivered by Pete. On Saturday morning, he would take one or two of the bigger boys over to a building behind the school, and the floor of this shack was a trap door, which was lifted by means of a pulley. Under it was another door, which, when raised, revealed a cellar cut out of the permafrost, forming a natural refrigerator. A vertical ladder against the wall led down into this ice chamber, where the carcasses of the year's supply of meat were cached. Pete would climb down among the carcasses, which were frozen rock solid, and reappear with a hind quarters slung across his shoulders. The joints were cut off with an axe and left in the kitchen to thaw overnight. The meat was very good to eat, much like beef in taste, with the accompaniment of cranberry sauce and thick gravy and dehydrated vegetables. It made a good Sunday dinner. At the mission, we had roast meat twice a week, and on other days we had fish, cottage pies, excellent soups, eggs, and canned meats. The eggs came in by boat with the supplies in July and were specially treated so that they remained eatable until the following July. By that time, they were getting a bit unpalatable, but they were still useful for cooking purposes.